Good afternoon. I appreciate uh, Mr. Preston letting me speak in his congregation. This is my third year in a row speaking to his congregations on the Sabbath after Thanksgiving, so it's becoming a little Thanksgiving tradition. Um, I was actually born in Columbia, South Carolina, so if any of you attended Worldwide Church of God from about 66 to 72, we used to attend church together, and it's good to see you again. Um, but uh, it is nice to be here in this, uh, in this area. You guys have a, a lovely hall. I really like this. I want to look today at a principle that's found in Ephesians 6. If you want to turn over to Ephesians 6. There's a principle mentioned here that uh, contains wise words that, that no matter what our age, we should follow. Ephesians 6, starting in verse 1, through verse 3, we read, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you, and you may live long on the earth. Now, before you tune out and think, oh, this is for the young ones, not true. This is for all of us. And, and the thing about this is, this isn't a magic thing that happens. You just obey your parents, and then like life is good for you because God said it was going to be good for you. It, it, it happens because your parents love you. Your parents tell you to do things like you don't run in a parking lot. And your parents know that cars will back out and you could get in, you could get run over or whatever, you could get hurt. So your life will be long and it will be good for you if you listen to your parents. So we're to obey our parents as little children. Life will be easier for you, always. And, and you might, and you get older and you become a teenager and you think, ah, they don't know. They know. They're only telling you things out of love and they want life to go good for you. But this also applies to us as adults. This command never goes away. It's not one where you reach a certain age and you're like, okay, I don't have to do that one anymore. This command should be with us as, throughout our lives because we're to obey God for many reasons. Um, but one reason is that life will be well with us, and our lives can be longer. If we reject the Word of God, we'll bring hardships in our lives. We just will. Today I want to look at someone who rejected the Word of God, and as a result of doing so, led to some pretty troubling times. Now, I would say a familiar story, but I try not to use phrases like that anymore because we have our youth who may not know the stories and, you know, we'll sometimes say familiar verses. We all know this verse. And, but it, I, I'm starting to realize as time goes on, the world is getting further and further away from the Word of God. So when people come into the church, we might refer to something as a familiar story, and they might have no idea what we're talking about. You know, if you, you start talking about the flood of Noah, and they say, well, I don't read the papers that much. I don't know about it. The world is not in tune with God's Word like they used to be. But this, for some of you, may be a very familiar story, but just because it's familiar doesn't mean there's things that uh, we can't learn from it, and we should go back and rehearse these stories. I'm talking about Jonah. So if you'll turn over to Jonah 1, Jonah 1 will start in verse 1. We'll be doing most of this uh, message in the book of Jonah, so if you don't like flipping around looking for verses, you're in luck. We're going to be in Jonah most of the time. Jonah 1, starting in verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amit. Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now that's a phrase that when God says their wickedness has come up before me, that their time is coming to an end. It's gotten so bad that it, it can no longer be overlooked. It can no longer be able to run its course. 
Um, and, and I have to think, looking at the world today, we're getting there. It's getting up to God. It's getting to the point where, okay, this is going to have to stop. But he says, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Now, I don't know that much about Jonah, but I would suspect this was a normal thing for him, that God would come to him and say, go to my people and say this. You know, it was, it was obviously something that was not out of the ordinary for him, but this was something that was out of the ordinary because God's telling him to go somewhere else, not to the nation of Israel. At this point, Jonah thought about it, and he said, I'm going to make this much harder than it has to be. He decided, I don't want to do that. So he began a process that many of us have followed, maybe many times. Hopefully, as we, as we grow and we come to the understanding of God's Word, we'll stop going through this process so often. But I'm sure many of us have gone through it many times. And hopefully we're learning a lesson every time we go through this process. And then we can fail to repeat that process over the same issue. It's a seven-step process that goes as follows. Step one, God gives us a command to do something. Pretty straightforward. God says, do this or don't do that. Step two, for whatever reason, we start thinking, contrary to what God told us. Start mulling it around in our mind. Do I really want to do that? Step three, we then decide, I'm not going to do that. And we start looking for another route. Figure out what are we going to do? What process are we going to follow that maybe it would be more comfortable for us to go that way? Maybe it would be easier And then we get to step four. The result is a crisis moment in our lives. We create crisis moments in our lives. Sometimes we get in these these places in our lives and we can think, how did I get here? And if we really follow back through, we'll see we put ourselves there. So we get to this crisis moment in which we have to cry out to God. We, we realize we've made a mistake, and we're in a situation, and, and I don't know how many of you have ever been in a situation where you, you just can't see a way out. I've been there. I'm sure you've been there throughout your life, and you, and you just think it's hopeless. There's no way out. So we cry out to God. Verse five, or point number five is we ask for God's forgiveness and the opportunity to be restored out of the mess that we made. Because we can get ourselves in such a mess that there's no way we can get ourselves out. But God can. And, and when God does intervene, it is such an amazing thing to see a problem that you think will be with you the rest of your life just disappear. And it happens when we get God involved. The sixth step of the process is God restores us and sets us on the right path once again. And then the seventh step, we gain an understanding of his original command and follow through in obedience. We get right back to where we started, and then we do what God said. So we're going to take some time here and go through this this seven-step process as as Jonah goes through it in his life. Uh, At this point, Jonah's at step one. God gave him a command. Go to Nineveh and tell them what I tell you. Let's see what step number two looks like. Just two short words here in verse three. But Jonah, there it is. His wheels are starting to turn now. Okay, God's told him to do something. He's been given that command, but then he starts having his own ideas. Is is that really best? Is that really what I should be doing? He's decided he doesn't want to do what God's commanded him, so he moves on to part three of the process, which is to take an action contrary to what God commands. Going on, verse 3, we read here, But Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, From the presence of the Lord, he went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish, so he paid the fare 
went down <clears throat> into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he is actively fleeing the face of God, actively going away from where God told him to go. Verse 4, But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest on the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down in the lowest parts of the ship and had lain down, and he was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And they said to one another, Come, let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. And they said to him, Please tell us. From whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? They're they're trying to figure out what could you have possibly done that would cause such a terrible storm. It's something like they had never been a part of before. Verse 9, he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, what have you, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he had fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do that the sea may be calm for us? For the sea was growing more tempestuous. And he said to them, Pick me up, throw me into the sea, and the sea will become calm for you. For I know that this great tempest is because of me. Jonah knew that he had done wrong, and God was trying to get his attention. He was fleeing from God, and God was like, nope, I got a job for you. He, he told the crew the only thing that would calm this storm would be if they picked him up and threw him into the sea. If they got him off of this ship that was going away from where God told him that the seas would become calm. Verse 13, Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous against them. So Jonah gave them a solution to their problem. He's like, you're going to have to throw me over. It's all me. But they didn't want to do that. They didn't want to be responsible for him. They ignored what he said, and they tried so hard to row towards the shore. Everything everything they had that... uh, their strength they were using to row against this storm, but it was not like anything they had experienced, and all their effort was in vain. Nothing was going to help them. Verse 14, Therefore they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done it as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased its raging. I'm I'm always impressed that they it was last resort that they that they did this. Even though he's telling them, "Throw me over," you know there there was there was something in them that they didn't want to be responsible for an innocent man's death. But they finally got so desperate to save their own lives and seeing the futility of trying to to fight this storm that they did as Jonah instructed them. And they threw him into the sea, and the storm subsided. They had to know at that point this was from God. Verse 16, Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. Now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now we're going to look at the prayer of Jonah. You see, Jonah realizes he's messed up. He has really caused a crisis in his life. And he he got there by not following God's command. So now he's going to move to step five, which is to seek forgiveness and to ask to be restored from the mess that he has himself in. Let's look at this prayer and what Jonah is saying in this prayer to God, starting in Jonah Chapter 2 and verse 1. 
Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. To be sure, this is one of the most unique places that we get to read a prayer from. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting when you when just, just reading that first line, Jonah prayed to the Lord from the fish's belly. And he said, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction. And he answered me, out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Jonah knew that God was a God that was near. He, you know, hopefully that would be our first impulse, would be to cry out to God. Jonah, that was his, he knew that even in the belly of the great fish under the sea, as far away from God as he could as he could be at that point, he knew that God could hear and answer him. He had faith in God. Even, even realizing that he was where he was because of his own stupid decision. Realizing, I put myself here. I removed myself from God, yet I will call out to God and he will hear me. Going on in verse 3, he says, For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me, and all your billows and your waves passed over me. Then I said, I have been cast out of your sight, yet I will look again towards your holy temple. The water surrounded me, even to my soul. The deep closed around me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. It's starting to sound like a very desperate situation. If you've ever been in the ocean and a wave takes you down and it kind of takes you a minute to get your footing and get back up, Jonah is surrounded by this. One right after the other, the seaweeds are starting to wrap around him. It sounds like a very desperate situation that Jonah knew he was not going to be able to save himself from. Verse 6, I went down to the moorings of the mountains. The earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my soul fainted within me, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer went up to you in your holy temple. Jonah's soul fainted within him. All hope was lost. But he did remember that God was there, and he knew that God would listen to him. He goes on in verse 8 and says, Those who regard worthless idols forsake their own mercy. Remember on the ship, they, they came into him and said, Look, if you have a God, get up and pray to him. Maybe he'll help us. You know, they were covering all bases at that point. They, they didn't care who anybody was praying to. They just wanted somebody to hopefully be worshiping a God that could have saved them from the distress that they were in. All their, all their regard there for their idols were, were worthless, and Jonah knew that. He knew that nothing they were going to do was going to save them from where they were. Jonah knew that God was someone to put faith in. He recognized that where the others had put their faith were worthless. Worthless idols, he says. And we have, we have our idols in this world today still. It seems like a, uh, an archaic term, an idol, but uh, if we really look uh, hard and deep, we'll, we will see that there are many idols still among us. But Jonah had no doubt that the God of Israel was the true God. He didn't go up and start praying to any of their idols or worshiping the way they were worshiping. He simply told them, look, it's me. It's the true God. This is the only thing that's going to save you. You guys can, you can do whatever you're doing to these idols, which they continued to do before they threw them overboard. He said, but it, it's not going to work. It's the true God. Verse 9, but I will sacrifice to you with a voice of thanksgiving. I will pay what I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. This brings us to step 6. Jonah's restored, rescued from his crisis, 
and once again set on the right path. The first words of Jonah 3 are interesting. Jonah 3, verse 1, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I have told you. God sets him back and says, Are you done playing? Arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. The exact same message that he gave him to start with, that Jonah ran from. Now Jonah enters step seven, which is to gain an understanding of the original command and follow through in obedience, to realize there's no sense fighting against God even if I don't want to do it. Verse three. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. It would take him three days to walk from one side of the city to the other. Even in our terms today of exceedingly great cities, that's a large area. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk, and then he cried out and said, Yet forty days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. The people of Nineveh repented. They listened to the message that Jonah brought. Could you imagine one of our cities today? Could you imagine if you walked downtown Columbia and started preaching the word of God, and people started listening, and people started repenting and changing, what an incredible thing took place here. The people of Nineveh repented. They listened to that message. Going on here, Jonah 3 and verse 6, Then the word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, He laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. The king, usually the kings were not humble people. This was a very humble thing that he did. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his riches and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. They're proclaiming a fast. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and turn from his violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? Then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them. And he did not do it. I don't know if you realize the extent of that turn that Nineveh took. But when they were to the point that their evil had reached up to God, they were about as bad as as humans can possibly get. And if you do any research on the people of Nineveh, they were extremely wicked people. Jonah took a long, wrong path just to get where God wanted him to go. He did make his life much harder than it had to be. I mean, you know, say Jonah's here, and God said go here, and then go on with your life. Jonah said, I'm going to go this way. And he took this long, arduous, hard, rocky path all the way back to where he was and then followed God and then went on with his life. All the unnecessary hardship he put himself through. What about us? What about you? If you're like me, you've gone through steps one through seven a time or two in your life. 
It's the human condition we're all born into. Romans 8 verse 7 says the the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. That's why we go down those paths sometimes. We choose sin over the commandments of God. And just like Jonah, many times it will put our lives in a crisis mode. We can become pretty desperate, trapped in what seems like an inescapable situation. Sometimes it's just easier to give in to sin. How does God talk to us? You know, I have a lot of people come up to me sometimes and say, I wish God would talk to me like he used to back in the days. God talks to us. How does God talk to us? He talks to us in many forms. He can communicate with us in dreams. There's many examples of God talking to people in their dreams. He can place thoughts in our, in our mind by way of his Holy Spirit. You know, you get that little nudge. Shouldn't do this. We can be given answers and sermons or conversations with others that God is working with. We can have a question in our mind that's there forever and, and it comes up in a sermon or a conversation with one of our brethren that God's called together with us. God can talk to us through his word, the Holy Bible. The point is, God does talk to us just like he talked to Jonah. It's what we decide to do next that is up to us once we hear the word of God. It can be a long, hard, seven-step process, or it can be an obedient reply from which we reap rewards and lead an easier life. For instance, God tells us not to steal. Pretty straightforward command. We then decide what we're going to do when placed in a situation. It can be a matter of convenience. Let's say, for instance, you're you're at Walmart and you're checking yourself out. You get out to the car, you're on taking all the groceries out of your cart, and you're putting them in your car, and you realize on the bottom of your cart, you've got a gallon of milk you forgot to scan. Okay, now you've got a situation. You shall not steal. I mean, that's a long way to go back in there just to have someone scan a gallon of milk. and My ice cream might start melting. You shall not steal. I mean, seriously, is a giant corporation like Walmart going to miss my $3.57? I mean, they make a ton. I'm sure they've overcharged me for things before. You shall not steal. Eh, I'll get it next time, if I remember. What happens when the sheriff shows up at your door charging you with shoplifting? This is not as far of a stretch as you might think because you'll, you'll notice that Walmart is and other stores are now starting to put the cameras everywhere. They watch you when you're checking out. They watch what you're scanning. They watch you walk out of the store to see which car people get into. And they are enforcing a lot more because prices are getting a little high right now. And there are a lot of people who will... Scan their stuff, one for you, one for me. It's more common than you would think, and stores are really starting to crack down on it. And I'm sure that whenever the sheriff does show up and charge someone with shoplifting, their first response is, well, it was an accident. I didn't mean to do it. But think of the situation that could put your life into. Because they are getting more and more serious about people who are shoplifting. 
we can start a very unnecessary process of making our lives much harder than it needs to be simply by not obeying God. We can always justify not obeying God. Jonah had his reasons, maybe many. Maybe Jonah had multiple reasons. Maybe he didn't want to go to Nineveh because he was afraid. I mean, it was a large city, a very violent city. The people of Nineveh were a very cruel, violent people. Maybe he was afraid for his life. Maybe he didn't think it would do any good. Maybe he thought, who's going to listen to me? If I go, we, we passed somebody yesterday that was carrying a sign and said something about, be, I don't even remember now, but it was along the lines of repent, the end is near. <laughs> and, and many people just drove by like nothing had happened. And that's probably what he thought. You know, if I go there, is it really going to, to do any good? Maybe he thought they were going to make fun of him or humiliate him. Maybe... He didn't like the people of Nineveh. After all, they were the cruel pagan enemy of Israel. Jonah 4, starting in verse 1. Now remember, the city of Nineveh had just repented and sackcloth and ashes and they're, they're fasting and they're doing all this stuff and, and enough so that God relented from destroying them. What would your attitude be? Jonah 4 and verse 1, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Jonah was mad. Verse 2, so he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord, was this not what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness. One who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me. It's better for me to die than to live. He didn't even want to see them flourish from having a relationship with God. He would rather be dead. Jonah didn't like the idea of Nineveh repenting. He knew if they did, God could forgive them. God would be gracious to them. He wanted them to be harmed for who they were. He wanted them to pay for their sins. He didn't want them to have the same forgiveness that God had granted him when he prayed for his wrongs from the belly of the fish. There's many lessons we can learn from the story of Jonah. Here are are a few of them. One is, God loves us. God loves each and every person in this room. But he also loves those we disagree with, those we resent, those we dislike. This was a story that Jonah had to learn. You may have someone in your life that you don't necessarily like, that gives you a hard time. How would you react if God called them here? Another lesson is that we cannot run away from God's presence no matter where we go. And that should be a comfort. Because Jonah, where he was, where he placed himself, knew that God was there. We cannot get so far away from God that if we truly repent, he won't listen to us. Another lesson is that God is patient with all sinners. And that that includes us, and we're thankful for that. But that also includes everybody else who sometimes we can see their sins so much better than ours. But the main lesson I was looking at today is that disobedience, disobeying God will only prolong and bring upon us unpleasant circumstances. It is not 
the lot of a Christian to suffer your whole life. Many times the suffering that we go through are things we brought on ourselves simply by not obeying God. So God talks to each of us. He gives us commands and laws to make our lives better. That's his only reason for giving us commands and laws, is to make our lives better. We're told our lives will be better now and in the kingdom. So it's not just, it's not just in God's kingdom that our lives will be good. This life can be good. I fully believe that a million years from now, God does not want us sitting around thinking, remember when we were humans? That was the worst ever. That was, the, that was such an awful time. God wants us to enjoy our life. And, and if, if we follow his commands, we can enjoy this life. Because he also gives us choices. We can follow his commands or we can do our own way. Pay the consequences and then hopefully come back to the proper understanding of where we went wrong, ask for, for forgiveness, get restored, and then do what God asked us to do from the beginning. The choice is yours. What will you choose? Mm-hmm.